cloud and it is now recording beautiful good afternoon and welcome to the second fall 2022 guest lecture in stat 407 data science programming methods we're thrilled to have john mount with us john is a uh, co-founder of WinVector, which is a consultancy in the west coast he is a computer scientist now dabbling in data science and uh, statistics author of multiple books RPM articles r packages and a very popular and powerful book that's at Manning that uh, I think I frequently reference in the course material too. Um, I've put a little bit more out on the bio on the usual page, so I don't want to make this too extended and just uh, say thank you to John and hand the reins over to him to uh, you know, share the screen and uh, um, um, lecture to us for uh, this hour. Well, great. Uh, thank you very much, Dirk, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm really thrilled to be talking in front of you and any of those that visit later. And um, so what I wanted to talk about was uh, basically data science in R, which is you know pretty close to your uh, course topic. So um, do people see just my slide? After you made the click. So I was just about to bring that up because beforehand we had the whole app. But whole no, app, yeah. Mode, presentation mode, it's perfect. Okay, great. So, um, so I'm titled, I'm actually, experimenting with can I get away with this talk and I'm calling this talk data science street fighting statistics so we'll see if uh, people are still speaking to me after this so again to reintroduce myself I'm a computer scientist and uh, the usual warning any field that has the word science in it is not a science uh, same holds for computer science um, my passion was randomized algorithms um, so actually I do know some things about probability prior to coming to statistics. And um, yeah, I'm very proud to be the co-author on the book, Practical Data Science with R, now in its uh, second edition. And uh, I'm author of a number of R and Python data science packages. So what I wanna talk about, and I'm gonna use two examples so this doesn't get all wooly, is some of the tension between statistics and data science. Um, Basically, there's a, a little bit of bad blood between the two fields, though most data science was invented in statistics departments. So, um, however, data science incorporates data engineering, optimistic use of machine learning, calling oneself an AI engineer, and a lot of other behaviors that statisticians are not so crazy about. I think if one boils it down, statistics emphasizes model identification and correct inference. Statistics, the word statistic means summary, and the field of statistics has been defined as saying, when do summaries of samples correctly represent summaries of the population the sample was drawn from? That it's, it's about correctness and how does the world try to lie to you? Data science is the optimistic application of machine learning. That if we spent enough money on the algorithm, maybe even with dirty data, something nice will happen. The difference is data science emphasizes the quality of model predictions, which I call fit to finish reasoning, that if the model appears to be correct, it is correct, which is a somewhat dangerous way of thinking. Either field can humiliate the other field by analyzing it in terms of their own terms. So data science does look stupid to statisticians, and I assure you there are some hard feelings the other way. Um, so I'm going to do a quick rundown with two concrete examples of what it looks like to rush where angels fear to tread and build a predictive model on two data sets without thinking much about it using R. So if you're in a rush and you know you're not going to be held accountable for what you've done, this is what I would do as a data scientist. So back to my hobby horse position. Supervised machine learning is a very specific task that captivated computer scientists around the 80s and the 90s. And this task is actually quite simple. You're given a table of explanatory variables, the Xs, and outcome variables or dependent variables, the Ys. And you're said, given all these examples of X becomes Y, this X becomes this Y, build an approximation function such as F of X is approximately y. And I'm being a little vague as to whether that squiggle means distributed as or approximate, but basically you're given a bunch, a table of what looks like function evaluations, x becomes y, and you say, well, build a function that does that, imitate the table. 
That's called supervised machine learning. The supervision is the specification of both the inputs and the outputs. And the idea is you have training data where you know both the inputs and the outputs, and you're going to have the model deployed in the future where you only have the inputs. And that's why you build a model. So the examples I'm going to use is predicting adult children's height from the parents' height. That obviously is the most famous linear regression problem, Galton's height data. Predicting cancer risk from facts about the person. And how does one get training data? You wait. Measure facts about the person. Wait a couple of years, see if they develop cancer. Now you've got data moved through time and you have your training data. The deep learning that we've seen so famously, like DALI and things that make pictures from descriptions or GPT-3, which finishes conversations, they're this brilliant idea of lying to the computer, which is not a sin because computers don't have souls. So the idea is you show it example datums, such as here's a picture, here's the description. Now you can then say, I will train something just like my training data, summarize pictures. If there's a dog in the picture, emit the sentence, this picture contains a dog. Or on the very last bullet of my slide, you can swap the X and Y columns and say a picture with a dog and it draws a picture with a dog. So you can lie to your machinery and say, actually, no, no, Y is coming, X is coming from Y. Here's some examples of somebody doing that. Why don't you do that also? And that's supervised machine learning, the data science task that computer scientists most obsess with. Now, there's some substantial problems here. Judging a process merely by its results means you don't understand how it works. You don't understand what happens if you're going to apply it to new datums. And it's, it's kind of the old fit to finish modeling that fails to fail isn't always the same as success. Um, now, my complaint, which I will share, that data scientists, statisticians believe this, and I believe it's true also, data scientists have developed a number of data rituals which are just maddening, that they do this to the data, then they do this to the data, and they claim that now they've done something really neat. Now, this, if you don't have reasons for what you're doing, it's magical thinking, and it's ritualism, and it, 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 it is a major problem with data science, and I try not to be guilty of it, but it is a valid statistical criticism of data science. However, and this table represents years of my life, so I only want you to look at the four bolded phrases. But the idea is if one organizes the defensive rituals you do to data by what fear are you trying to mitigate, then they start to make sense. So I'm going to talk about regularization in this talk. Now, why am I doing regularization? I'm going to do it because I'm afraid of collinear variables, which I will define. So if there are no collinear variables in my data set, maybe I shouldn't regularize. Um, I'm also going to talk about unbalanced classes, and I will define a little later. And I'm going to say, when you think that's in your data, you might consider reweighting your data, and you'd be wrong. And the data scientists do this all the time, and there's quite a little industry about writing articles about reweighting your data and building tools that reweight your data. And I'm going to say, please don't reweight your data. A uh, number of great uh, statisticians like Norm Matloff have said this in their books. I'm saying it also, don't reweight your data. And we'll explain why in this talk. So the rest of this table is just fear, but only look at the bolded ones. To repeat that, I'm only going to discuss discuss two bugbears. Collinear variables, which is a st statistician's fear. Data scientists do not care about collinear variables. And unbalanced classification class tasks, which is a data scientist fear, which statisticians rightly know does not matter. And uh, the, all the slides and materials are here at this URL. So what are collinear variables? It's when Two variables or more, but two is the easiest to discuss. It's when two variables in your data set are essentially the same information. For instance, distance in meters and distance in feet. Yes, there are different numbers, but they're essentially the same information. A standard linear regression cannot use perfectly collinear variables. The algorithm will fail. Now, so you need to know which one to eliminate. So here's a classic example 
of collinear variables. And this data is in that GitHub repository I linked to. And this is, of course, our code. And I'm going to read the table Galt, Galton's height table. Now, Galton did not have R. So he could not fit multilinear linear regression problems. He could only do one variable. So his problem was to predict the adult height of children, which is this height column in inches, from the father's and mother's heights. And since he didn't have multilinear regression code, he reduced it to one variable by creating a new variable called the mid-parent height. And the mid-parent height is the average of the father's height and the mother's height inflated by 8%. So I think what he's doing here is he's rescaling the women in his data set who are probably around 8% shorter than the men to be in the same units as the men or the same height spectrum. Uh, so this is what he defined as the mid-parent height. And this data set looks like this. Now, mid-parent height is a collinear variable. Once you know father and mother, you know mid-parent height. So no standard linear regression can work with all three of these variables present. So I'm a data scientist, so I'm going to endorse held out evaluation that most we judge our projects and how they'll be used. Most projects are built to service data that was not available during training. They, the project is built now in the present and is deployed in the future. So we attempt to imitate that nature of data, data not seen during training, by a procedure called holdout or test set. Now, if holdout data is a useless procedure, we just lose a little statistical power. We're not using all our data when training when we do holdout data. But if holdout evaluation is different than standard evaluation, then holdout's the one we trust because it's a better imitation of how we're going to apply the model in the future. Linear models do not need held out data usually because they're very well understood. Deep neural nets, tree-based methods need held out data because their behavior on training data does tend to be very different than their behavior on future data. So what I'm going to do is called a structured holdout. And again, this is data scientist talk. There was a column in that data set called family. And I'm going to say all the children of one family either all go into my training set, which I'm going to use to build the model, or they all do not go into the training set. So to do that, and this is the joy of R, I'm going to spend a little time on this code. We just say, well, what are the unique values of family in this data frame? Then put 80% of the families into my training set, call them the training families. And then the training data set is all the families that all the rows that were in the trained families. And the test data set is the complementary rows, all the families that weren't in the trained families. So this is very succinct. And R is built to manipulate data. So we expect good data manipulations to be fairly short. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a model on this subset of data called training data. That's called statistically inefficient because I am not using all of my data to build the model. So I will experience a higher variance in the modeling procedure than somebody that used all the data, but I'm I'm trading that off against the safety of having at least some data that was not built used to build the model to evaluate the model. And again, the structured split is this model is expected to work on families I've never seen. So splitting a family into testing and training would be a data leak. It would make the data model work better on the training data and test data than it will on the future data. So this sort of structured split is used in web companies all the time. All the activities of a single user are usually put in a train or test. You do not split a user session because you're not simulating the behavior of the model of a new user. You'd then be simulating the behavior of the model on a returning user. So here's our model. I'm calling our good friend LM in R to fit a standard ordinary least squares model. So it's this called linear regression. Least squares is the loss or criticism that we want to make the square difference between predictions and actuals small. And this is the formula interface in R. We're saying model height as a function of father plus mother plus mid-parent. This is not actual addition. It's just saying model this column as a function of these three columns. So this is called the formula interface. And we're saying use this as our data set. 
then we call summary on this fit model and I'm sending it to Knitter to get a HTML table that is uh, presented here. And we get that the um, intercept, which is the, this model is saying that children, adult children tend to be about 19.7 inches plus about 0.4 inches for every inch of height in the father and about 0.3 inches for every inch of height in the mother. Um, these two coefficients don't add up to one. This was the shock of Galton. This is called regression to mediocrity. So if tall parents tend to be taller than their children, short parents tend to be shorter than their children. These two numbers not adding up to one was considered a big deal and quite a lot of science is around that. Uh, the rest of this is just a commentary on the quality of the estimate column. Um, this difference in height dependence um, is very unstable with respect to our uh, test train split that I have seen with other test train splits, these two numbers come out equal. Uh, this is actually where I think you do some fun science. Like you would think a child's height is more dependent on the mother than the father by biology, but then you have to remember the family's diet depends more on the father in 18th or 19th century England, So, which also has an effect on height. So the father coming from a rich family probably more correlates with his family being rich. So the father may have non-biological sorry, are non-genetic effects on height, like whether he brings his family gruel or steaks. Um, Quick now, um, if you go back to the slide, because you included mid-parent, but it's not in the table. I wish I had said that, so I'm so glad you interjected that. The, that that's super important. The, I included mid-parent as a variable, and it's not one of the row labels of the table. The OLS, the LM implementation detects collinear variables and eliminates them. So what it does is it says this problem would be ill-conditioned or underspecified if all three parents were all three variables were allowed into the analysis, and it eliminates one. It's fairly arbitrary which one it eliminates. Um, so and. So it, it crossed out mid-parent height, but that's not because it's a derived variable. It could have just as easily crossed out father or mother. So the modeling procedure is unstable with respect to which variable is eliminated. And that's a worry. And that's actually the picture I wanted to do here. If these two chicks are two different variables that could have been in the model, eliminating a variable is landing on the head of one and using it as a platform to feed the other. Um, I, I just, I like this slide. Um, so that is a problem. That that fitting procedure is unstable, is not implementable in the presence of collinear variables, defends itself against collinear variables in a way that is unstable. Another running of this with slightly different data could maybe cross out father. So it, it's uh, it had probably crossed out the most informative variable that the the father plus mother is better than just mid parent, but mid parent is the most informative single variable. So just because a variable got crossed out by the fitter doesn't mean it was a loser. If taking a look, it means jointly, it had no information once father and mother were present, but it may have been the best variable all by itself. So here's another model. So that was the statistician's model. That, And that choice of variable is so important that the statistician should have made it, not the algorithm. That which variables are present or absent is a super important choice. It should not have been left to the algorithm. This is called a regularized linear regression. This is the data scientist's approach. So uh, we're saying that the variables are father, mother, and midparent. And we're using a very unfortunate calling convention that GLMNet doesn't use the formula interface natively. And we're saying the stimulus are, um, I hate to use the word independent, but the explanatory variables are these columns of our data frame and the column we're trying to predict is this column of our data frame the uh these are called hyperparameters which is the fancy name for any control that controls the behavior of the algorithm so the the algorithm's name itself glmnet is a hyperparameter this setting means do l2 regularization which i'll define in a second how do i know that i read the manual this is the setting uh, that old people pick. I think the kids now pick a one here, but if you were trained about L2 regularization in the 90s, you would pick about one 1,000. That you, you said, I want a little bit of L2 regularization, but not a lot. But now they're like, ah, just take a bunch. Um, now, 
correct use of hyperparameters is you have to search for correct values of these, that maybe there's a value better than one one thousandth here. So we then uh, plot out the model table using our good friend, the new R native pipe. Beta is what it calls the parameters. It does not have the um, significance codes. These parameters are almost identical to what the previous model fit, except for mid parent is present with a slight negative um, correlation. And it means that once you know father and mother, mid parent is, is very minorly dealing with over counting of having both these variables present. It, it's sort of decorrelating father plus mother. So this is the data scientist view, fire and forget. Now, L2 regularization means that for normal fitting, we try to minimize the distance between the model's predictions and the training examples. For L2 regularize, we say minimize that plus the sum of squares of the coefficient sizes. So try to push all the coefficients towards zero. From the statistician's point of view, this ruins everything. Your theory of significance is gone. You, so you no longer have p-values or confidence intervals because you didn't fit according to the correct OLS procedures. Adding that extra thing to the optimization ruined the problem. So you lose all the diagnostics because the distributional statements become harder. But from the data scientist's point of view, all the variables stayed in and they're all doing something. So we walk briskly away. Now, how effectively different are the two models on this data set? They're indistinguishable. This is the root mean square error. The difference between the actual value and the prediction is called the error. We square it so that being over some places can't cancel being under others. Uh, we take the mean so that we're independent of the number of rows in the data set. And then we take the square root to get it back into the original units. Like this was in inches. Uh, squaring it puts it in inches squared, but that's not area. It's a nonsense unit called squared inches. So it's not really a good unit. So square root puts us back into the original units. So it says this model is typically off. This does the role of a standard deviation. This model is typically off by about 3.4 inches. The other model is typically off by about 3.4 inches. And the two predictions are usually about seven uh, hundred thousandths of an inch apart. The, the two models, well, they had almost identical coefficients and they have almost identical behaviors. So you would not be able to tell the difference between the two models on the data we have. How semantically different are the models? This is the trick, they're very different. The traditional model doesn't look at the variable mid-parent. So if in future data, somebody just put garbage values in that variable, the first model's immune to that. It doesn't use that variable. So if that variable all of a sudden goes bad, it would be immune. Um, the L2 is actually fairly safe and it's very similar to the classic statistical procedure principal components analysis. That it's saying all the variables roughly do the same role, which might be false, but that's its assumption. And I'm just gonna smear them all together and use an average. And often the average is more stable than the originals, but you'll often see this methodology or the PCA methodology in scientific code. Like if you're trying to relate tree rings to rainfall, tree rings of two different trees are very correlated with each other. And instead of throwing one out, you'd say use a PCA method. And to extent what it does is it averages them together very roughly. So machine learning as I teach it in AI build a model that is superficially indistinguishable from a correct model. That's what's happening with these GPT-3 conversation systems. Like you have people going up to GPT-3 conversation system and saying it passed the Turing test. And the reason it passes the Turing test is people are lazy and stupid, that they talk to it for a bit, it looks like it's giving back plausible text and they're all, well, that's about as much as I'd read from anyone else. Therefore, it's indistinguishable from a person so it passes the Turing test. Though when they dig in, you'll find out that GPT-3 says some weird stuff, like what's the best way to cure a he headache if you're on the top of the stairs? And it'll say something like flip backwards. Um, so it, it, it's not answering questions the way you think it was. So um, models fit to be close to their training data are often best possible on their training data. For instance, the linear regression of all the linear models in the world, none is going to look better on the training data than ordinary least squares. 
So if you get a very expensive Bayesian hierarchical linear model that does all this inference of unseen or unobservable variables such as seasonality and external effects, the same variables in OLS will out will cannot underperform the Bayesian model because the OLS is defined to be the best performing model. That's literally its search criteria. Now, the Bayesian model is often much more useful, like it infers correct values and distributions of unobserved subsystems, which is super important. However, if you make your criteria good at predicting, you can't tell the difference. So LLS wins. Um, so the statistical view of this would be you may have the wrong model, even if every prediction it makes is right. And that's because every prediction it makes is right is right on the training data. What happens when you give it new data? Um, model identification is important because we're going to ask for counterfactuals. Like if we say to somebody, eating less salt may extend your lifetime, we're not trying to say you're correlated with people that lived longer. We're trying to say that you will live longer if you make this one change in your life. So that's um, the statistical view. The data science view is much more pragmatic. I'm, call, I'm paid to call predict. We're done here. So data science models tend to be much better at predicting things, but they're much worse at extracting advice. Because if a data science model says lowering salt extends your lifetime, it just means you're more like long-lived people. It doesn't mean that it'll extend your lifetime. So model identification is super important. Now, the each one, again, back to my original thesis, can criticize the other. The statistician can say the data scientist is a jerk because they can't deal with counterfactuals. And the data scientist can say the statistician's a jerk because without the right model structure, they can't deal with counterfactuals either. That this fitting doesn't, you cannot ask counterfactual questions on a model that the structure doesn't represent physics. So to build a biological model, you need a biologist to tell you how the biology works and then use the statistics just to fit some parameters, but you don't identify the model structure yourself. So that, um, to say that again, is statistics is the master at computing conditional distributions. What is the probability of y taking on various values given I know x? x again being the explanatory variables, y being the classic dependent variable. Data science is actually about the joint probability. What is the probability of seeing x and y together for only x, y's similar to your training data? So the statistician can move outside of their training data, the data scientist cannot. And it, 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 it's a subtle distinction. So let's move on to another topic. There's only two topics. So, uh, so that's the nature of fitting. To summarize, data scientists, if the model looks good on the training data or held out copy of the training data or something like that, they're happy. St statistician, the model has to actually make sense or have correctly inferred the interior structure of the world. Uh, let's move on to unbalanced classes. So this is a lot of... Uh, not sure if they're penguins, but some sort of marine bird, and this one doesn't look like the others. So this is a problem you will never have in R. This is a case of tools deforming the hands that Python users have this problem like crazy. So in a classification problem, instead of, it's traditionally defined, and I hate this definition with all my heart, they say if the task is to say whether it's an adult or juvenile bird, we give it data where every bird is labeled as adult or juvenile. And then the classifier is to say for a given bird, say its height, weight, things like that, is it an adult or a juvenile? That, and people have written essays excoriating people that don't agree with this. This is a dumb idea. We don't care whether any bird is adult or juvenile. We care about our confidence of such a determination. We want to know that this bird is 99% likely to be an adult, this bird's 30% likely to be an adult. This bird's 20% likely to be an adult. The classification labels are the most useless thing about classifier problems. The training data, yes, the outcomes are all pure labels. This one is labeled as an adult. This one's labeled as a, as a juvenile. But the model should not reproduce class labels. And I'm going to argue that really, really hard here. And the, the longer it takes for you to believe me, the louder and quicker I will get. So R pretty much agrees with me. The R predict function for a classification problem returns either the link or the probability. And 
either one's good enough. They return a numeric score that the higher the score is, the more certain the model is that you're in the class. And this is good because most business problems are sorting. This is something that's made me sort of kept me in living indoors is that most business problems are sorting. We don't care if the person's actually going to click on this advertisement. We have to serve an advertisement. Should it be this one or this one? So we serve them the one with the higher probability of them clicking. We don't actually care about the actual odds or probability of them clicking. We want to, among many advertisements, give them the best one. So it turns out almost all business applications of classification are sorting or ordering problems. So R does not have this problem. Python has this problem. So here's a classification example. Um, this is kind of fun, and to spend some time on the code. This is from a breast cancer data set. The data set is heavily summarized, possibly to make it smaller, possibly to semi-anonymize it. Um, so I have in the readme in the link where we got this from. Uh, this is it being read in. So we're just using read CSV to read the compressed file. So we don't have to uncompress it. We can read a gzipped file. We could actually put the original URL here. So we can actually, we don't even need the file in our file system. So ours read.csv is a pretty powerful little monster. Um, when I read the data dictionary, and you always have to read the data dictionary, it says the outcome is breast cancer history one means they have a breast cancer incident, zero means they do not, and nine means it's undetermined. So I decided to limit down just to the rows that had known outcomes. So this is what I'm saying, that my data set D is my original data set where the breast cancer history indicator is, is zero or one. And again, this is this, this great ability of R in a single command to pick sets of rows. This here, I'm calculating the prevalence of breast cancer in the data set. So this data set, each row may represent many individuals that have the exact same measurements. So you have to weight it by the count column, which again, I got by reading the data dictionary. So a given row might represent one patient, or they may represent 100 similar patients. So you have to weight it by the count. So by weighting this 0-1 indicator had breast cancer by the count divided by the total count, we have a 10% prevalence of breast cancer in this data set. Obviously, that's a very depressing and large number, but it's imbalanced. That 10% is way less than 50%. So this is a data set where the prevalence or outcome class distribution is unbalanced. Now, this is a fix that you will not know as an R user unless you've been contaminated by the Python users. A lot of people would say the first step to do is to rebalance or resample or reweight the data set so it's 50-50. Please do not do that. Um, so let's prepare the data for analysis. Um, the columns I can use as variables are independent variables or explanatory variables. And I just I'm I just gotta stop saying independent. I hate the use of that word that way. Are these column names? I read this from the data dictionary. Each and every one of them is an integer re-encoding a table. So this age group five years is numbers one through nine. And each one of them represents a different age group. And so these are all essentially string valued variables. Some of them have order, which I am ignoring. But um, so these are all actually string valued variables superficially encoded as integers, which would make them look like numbers. Now, when we put numbers into a model, we're saying that numbers that are near each other are similar and numbers that are far apart are very dissimilar. But since these are re-encoded symbols are just a string dictionary, that's not true for these numbers. So we need to treat them as strings. Otherwise, we lose modeling power. So I'm converting each one of these back to strings because the CSV reader, when it saw them as digits, it converted them to integers, which is not what they are. They are actually strings that happen to superficially look like integers. So I'm converting them all back to integers. Again, your Python friends will be scared to death of this step. They don't have the formula interface R has, so they actually cannot directly fit on strings. They cannot use strings as explanatory variables. They then have to one-hot encode them by hand, whereas this is a built-in function in R. You, as an R user, may not know you cannot use strings as explanatory variables because R has the standard converter to fix that problem. So we are trying to trigger that. 
So here is a classification fit. So we're using GLM, which is a generalized linear model. We are doing this magic incantation called family equals binomial link equals logit. This is a copy paste piece of information. This is the command to say, hey, GLM, you're a Swiss army knife that can do very many things. I would like you to perform the mathematical logistic regression. So logistic regression is a model. It's a classification model. The explanatory variable is a symbol, in this case, zero or one, and it builds the probability of being one. It's called logistic regression, but it is a classifier. So there's some naming problems here. Um, the, we're going to use the formula interface, but I don't really feel like typing in all those variable names again. Uh, so I'm going to program over it. I'm using my own package wrapper, and I'm saying build a formula that breast cancer history is a function of these variables. So that's all it does is it pastes the formula together for you. And then we hit one of the really horrible things about R, that GLM and LM, I need weights because each row represents a different number of individuals. So I need to tell the fitter, hey, this row is 100 people, get it right. This stupid weights argument is evaluated late and in the environment of the formula. So even though you and I know the weights is this D count column of the data frame, this code will fail because this the D variable will not be in the environment of the formula. So this extra value says, you know what? The stupid call we're doing is going to be looking for a, a data frame named D. Can you please copy that into your environment? Um, I cannot emphasize enough how much I hate the fact that formulas have environments in R. It, it's just needlessly complicated and horrible. Um, so you could just type out the formula here, but again, that's going to involve these 20 or so variables. So this is the short way to do it, despite the fact it ate up some of my class time to explain it. Uh, we fit that model. The important thing, I'm a data scientist, not a statistician. So the important thing is calling predict, not summary, right? So the important thing is calling predict. Here I call predict on it. Um, always use new data to tell it what data to predict from because models in R hide a copy of the data. So if you call predict, they might run on the old data instead of the new data. Yes, this happens to be the same data, D is D, but just get in the habit of there always should be a new data command and predict or you get burned. Um, I didn't bother to do hold out here. I'm doing type equals response. And it says the first example has a score of 0 0.006. The next example has a score of 0 0.1. And the third example has a score of 0 0.006. Now this is interpretable. Remember, um, this is a probability when it's in response. Remember our prevalence was 10%. So it says the second individual has the typical cancer risk of the data set. It's saying the first and third individuals have about half the cancer risk of the data set because the, it says the probability of them having cancer in this data set is 0.006, not 0.1. Actually, no, it's, sorry, it's way under. It's like these people look great. Um, this is, sorry, this is like one fifteenth of the risk. Uh, I can't do math in my head in front of you. I'm just trying to say that 0.006 is a lot smaller than 0.1, and 0.1 is pretty close to the prevalence. Now, the predict is always a number between zero and one. Remember the original training data, which is what we're looking at in this table command, is always is always zero, is always one. In the training data, everybody either had a breast cancer incident or they did not. However, we the prediction gives a probability instead, or a propensity, depending on what we're doing. Now, the amazing thing about logistic regression, and I just can't praise logistic regression enough, I, I, regression enough, I do it at parties, is that prediction imitates the training data. In particular, if I sum predict weighted by count, I get the prevalence back. If I sum the original have cancer or not in the same weighting, I get the prevalence back. The prediction from a totaling point of view or an averaging point of view looks just like the right answer. It might get every individual wrong. Like this person probably didn't have cancer, so the correct prediction would have been zero, not 0 0.006. So it's a little wrong in every individual, but it gets all the totals right. This is on biasedness, and this is why logistic regression is so useful in industry. Now, obviously, it can achieve this just by saying everybody has a 10% chance of cancer. It gives everyone the same prediction. It'll get the totals right, but it didn't do that. 
it says that this person has one fifteenth the chance of cancer in this one. So who do we send a brochure to? Who do we send a practical nurse to? We send it to patient two, not patient three. So again, sorting. Um, so the fallacy, back to John's hobby horse, why not to ask for the class label? Well, to convert the probability into a prediction, you have to compare as to whether the prediction is above or below a half, because that's the least ac that's sorry, that's the most accurate conversion. That if it says they probably have cancer, you'd say, well, then I'll just put it down for cancer. If they say it probably doesn't have cancer, I'll put them down for not cancer. Well, only 10% of this population had cancer. So saying nobody has cancer is a pretty accurate estimator. It's 90% right, just completely useless and will kill people. So accuracy is a horrible, horrible measure. So if we do this conversion, we compare the predictor to a half, it thinks the world has a 3% prevalence of cancer. It's off by a multiplicative factor of three. And that's because we didn't inform it. What's our value of false positives, saying somebody has cancer if they don't, or false negatives, saying they don't have cancer if they don't. Accuracy says the two mistakes are indistinguishable. And that's not the case. So this prevalence, this pseudo prevalence of the classifier for very imbalanced classes, like say 1% incidence, immediately goes down to zero. That for all your data science work, if you accidentally call class label instead of probability, you build a classifier that says nobody has the condition. And that's a very accurate classifier. It's just accuracy as your metric kills the business. So the way practitioners in Python do it, because it's easier to code than think, is they reweight the data to be 50-50. That gives them a classifier that sometimes says yes, sometimes says no. Um, I just can't polite, I can't be polite about it. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna move on that. So the underlying problem, what causes this? People are not inherently bad. What problem is that in, Eng in American English, accuracy is a synonym for quality. It, it's the only metric taught most places, but it's also when somebody, a business person says they want an accurate classifier, they just mean they want a high quality one. That it, it just, you have to not be a genie and give them the wish they asked for as a consultant. Again, I work as a consultant. You have to give them what they really need. And again, not behind their back. You have to consult with them and educate them on that. So when somebody says accuracy, they almost never want that, even if they know the definition. And um, my advice there, and we're getting towards the end here, and I know we are running out of time, but we're on we're on target, is learn ROC plots and AUC as your metric. Do not use accuracy as your metric, and don't use F1. That's kind of derpy, too. And here's, here's ROC. Don't bother to learn ROC. Learn sensitivity and specificity. Sensitivity. And again, I write this down because I can't remember it. Sensitivity is what fraction of the sick people do you find? You want your sensitivity to be one. Specificity is what fraction of the non-sick people do you leave alone? You also want that to be one. Now, for a given score, one can introduce whatever threshold we want, not the half, which is the highest accuracy threshold, but any other. That threshold, you say anybody with a cancer score of above 0.25, I'm worried about. You don't say they have cancer. You say, anyone with a score above 0.25, I'm worried about. At that, at that 0.25 threshold, we have a specificity of about 0.8. We leave 80% of the healthy people alone. Don't give them a cancer scare. We have a sensitivity. I'm just running up that X column of 0.25 and then reading off the Y values. We have a sensitivity of around 0.6. We, we get 60% of the sick people back in for a rescreening. Now, what's the right sensitivity and specificity? Depends on the population. Are there a lot of sick people or not? And the application. Is this an early screening test? For instance, is it a COVID test? When I mean, you're going to a party, then you want the sensitivity to be very high. You don't care if somebody you don't like doesn't get to go to the party because they got a false positive, but you do care that somebody sick shows up at the party and infects you all. So for early screening tests, you want sensitivity even if it costs you specificity. So this graph is a non-standard graph. It's easy to make, it's one liner in R. It's um, 
it's what's for every clefts of threshold where you say threshold to say what number at that or above do you tell the person you're worried? What's the every threshold? Our policy gives you a different sensitivity and specificity trade off. Um, and also, this is something I've learned as a consultant. Never be the last person involved in any decision. So land this score in their database and say, I think if you tag everybody above 0.25 is at risk, you'll have a good business. Uh, but I'd like you to write that business logic. So you write the if statement. So basically, just always be the next to last or penultimate step. So then when they start mailing people the, the wrong info, you say, well, I gave them a score. I didn't know how they were going to use it. So you're, you're innocent. Um, now this line of code here, can you see my mouse? The second line of code, D expanded is D rep. This is the wonder of R. Once you understand R, you realize that this is about 30 lines of code in any other language. That remember I said that each row of data represents multiple examples. Well, to make this plot, I need each row of data to represent one example, because that's how this plot's defined. Well, how do I do that? How do I take a data frame that each row represents multiple implicit rows and blow it up. Like the row that has a 10 in it, I want 10 copies of it. The row that has a three in it, I want three copies of it. Well, you just use this indexing notation and you say, I want each row the number of times that's in its count column. So you replicate the row IDs. And then you say, I want that many. I, I did not invent this. Somebody showed this to me on Stack Overflow. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so right. I hate myself. So I this line here, right above WV plots, that's the beauty of R. It was designed to manipulate data. If you're doing the data manipulation, you're doing it wrong. That R, either base R or a package, does so much for you. So time to wrap up. All the wooliness aside, we're just talking about competing estimates that fit different needs. So there's no one true method to analyze data. It's all competing methods to analyze different needs. And so which ones are appropriate depend very much on what you're doing and what you're held responsible for. Um, so summary, this was a talk about tricks. We talked about rebalancing the data. I begged you not to do that. We talked about um, eliminating columns in OLS. And we talked about regularizing, which as statisticians may have some serious issues with because you give up a lot when you regularize. Again, that's adding a penalty to the coefficients. Um, so beware of applying too few or too many tricks. You can't take the high road and say, I don't need any tricks to process the data. The world is horrible, you need tricks. Each trick you use should be justified. There should be a concrete fear that is present in your data that you are mitigating. Um, and again, back to what is statistics and data science. Um, statistics is a formal study of when samples correctly represent the populations they're drawn from. Data science is the optimistic application of machine learning methodologies that, hey, this machine learning method was built by a PhD, therefore it should be great when I use it. Or to be evil, and this is why some people don't like me, statisticians like to call some rain ANOVA. They can get a lot out of model with never having called predict. Data scientists have really no other trick than to call predict that if, if they can't solve their problem by calling predict they're 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 stuck. In either case, the fears of the practitioner are not always the fears fears of the theoretician, and it depends on context which one is the right one. Um, now, consider reading one of these articles and certainly not all, and many of them don't have an editor. Any of the ones by Nina are excellent. Uh, any ones by me are often a little manic. Um, in particular, I strongly, represent, uh, strongly recommend this accuracy one. It, it strengthens the point of why not to use accuracy and why anyone that uses accuracy is a bad person. Um, the, if you're interested in the deep math of logistic regression, she really nails it in the simpler derivation of logistic regression. She shows you why the balance conditions are true without having to read all of Agresti. And, this is a polemic. Can a classifier that never says yes be useful? And again, a classifier that never says yes would be comparing to that stupid one half threshold. And then uh, the hobby horse we've been pushing everybody is this vtreat package, which is our trick of re encoding high cardinality categorical variables while minimizing overfit. So, yes, we even inflicted a trick on the world also. And again, probably it's been invented again and again. Um, and we do cite where. Um, but it's. Um, yeah, it, it, tricks are so important, you'll end up inventing ones for your problem domain yourself. 
and I want to thank you for your time and attention. And I know some of you will be watching this taped. And hey, guess what? You don't get asked questions. I really enjoyed that. I hadn't seen the golden example. But I think I will get back to that <laughs> because it's a super important point between statistics and numerical analysis that we're actually not fitting x prime x inverted times x to get beta value. It's sort of the pivoting that finds the low rank solution and, and then eliminates them. And I had at one point looked for an example that demonstrates that, and this one may actually do. But the, and also, I like that you showed that the predictions then are uh, indistinguishable. Does that hold when you do L1 instead of L2 and or when you do elastic net and, you know, let it choose? It That's a really good question. So again, in regularization, just to get the context back out, which I, everyone here knows, is L2 regularization means you penalize by the square of the coefficient sizes. L1 means you penalize by the absolute value. Now, it's well known that L1 regularization tends to turn off variables. So it will eliminate a variable. Um, and elastic net is any intermediate combination of those two penalties, because once you figure out how to do L1, you can do both. Um, now, what I found is if there's no rare examples, all three of the methods look very similar. But it's it's when there's these weird outlier examples that they start behaving very differently, like uh, indicators and rare values. So the, the, in industry practice, the three fits tend to look very different. Do you have preferences? I mean, I'm an go, old. Go to methods. Among I'm them? an old. I'm an old man, so I use L2 because I figure it smushes all the variables together and averages them, which I feel more comfortable with. Though, if you went to L1, you would have invented compressed sensing. So, if your representation is sparse and particularly good, L1 is is literally magic. Um, yeah, I, it's it's weird. I. not seen rich in L2 as an econometrician. I'd seen mm. it in industry once I'd been working and that hit me too hard in, in late in life. And I found that suspicious. I never developed good intuition or liking why I should shrink my coefficients to zero. And uh, see keep all of them. I have a strong preference then, or between the two of them, I like L1 more because it makes the model smaller. And that helps with the problem, of course, that you presented, that we have collinear variables. In practice, of course, they're, they're, you know, and you're a real mathematician. I only pretend to be one from the social sciences. You know, it's a sort of the full rank problem. What you showed there was a degenerate example because it is actually a linear combination because constructed that way. The real problem that we often have is that they're not perfectly so, and then it gets even murkier. But that's I, why I made a clear I really example. I really like methods that reduce the variable set in a sensible way. So um, mass um, is is nice for that. L1 is nice for that. And then I they always, you know, because you can't argue with, with Hasty, Tim, Shirani, and Friedman. Um, so if they start with L1 and L2 and then propose elastic net as a better data-driven way in the middle, I have a big soft spot for that. But it... It depends because then you also have another hyperparameter or another cross validation loop that you need to run. So it's not as easy to implement. And I, I really like the operational simplicity of, of OLS and, and logistic as well. So it, it, it all depends. It's, it's... Well, let me emphasize, you said it way better than I would have. Let me emphasize back L1 eliminates stepwise regression, which is a horrible methodology. So, so wanting to eliminate a few variables is a very valid desire. And the previous technology before L1 to do it was stepwise regression, which is completely unfounded. It is, so L1 is eliminating some very bad technologies. Um, so yeah, that's. I wish I'd thought of that point. Very good point. L1, I think, is a little easier to justify. And the thing I was laughing at you is you said shrinkage. That's the frequentest way of thinking about L2. L2, you can also say Bayesian that there's a prior uh, I don't know where you got the prior, but there's a prior that the coefficients are small, and then you can derive L2, but where you got that belief that the coefficient... Shrinkage makes everything sound much more complicated than just saying I... than using a Bayesian formulation of that. But again, your, your argument for L1 is convincing, because I think of how horrible stepwise regression is on overfitting, and I got to respect that. Sorry, I got excited. Everything you said was great. I just got super excited. Um, any other questions or comments or we actually am 
as I said, Mars. So I had a lot of fun in the past and got a lot of huge out of the Earth package, which, you know, because Mars is copyrighted, because it's sold back. So you can't use that to Earth. This is these, these piecewise linear um, splines are really great. And it does a really good job also at, at throwing variables out. And I think we have someone coming tomorrow, but I'm otherwise busy who will. Uh, We'll do lasso for Mars. That sounds like a really good. Talk. That sounds really good. I wish I'd had some time with Mars because I think the linear combinations of hinge functions is really smart. Yeah. But again, I never got to use it when I was younger because it was patented or copyrighted. But I, I think, I think it represents a really good set of ideas. Um, yeah. Yeah, my go-to always was that, you know, it generalizes the, you have your scatter plot example that everybody knows, and then why force yourself to draw a straight line through? I mean, because these days, if I look, I mean, and someone like David Shaw put something about regression, his go-to model now seems to be GAN. So I don't use those all that often, but but Earth was always very cheap because piecewise combinations of the hinges is, is really cheap, really quick, uh, easy to implement, fast to implement, fast to evaluate and predict. So I'm, anyway. Yeah, I might take that advice. I think I've not thought about that enough. Um, yeah, so which aspect? Sorry. Well, I was going to say to the students that here come later, it's it's empirical for us. We try different algorithms. We read the papers. We go, this guy sounds good. This guy sounds like the devil, and then we'll try on a yeah, few I, data sets. I, I, I didn't even finish my story there. I cut myself short. I mean, you start with a scatter plot, you draw a straight line, but it's easy to find um, data sets that have some element of curvature. And then, of course, many people have proposed many things about that. So people going with spines and, I mean, and knots and whatever. And that of just just going in there and letting the data, uh, letting the method choose from the data a little bit more curvature and kinks uh, has demonstrably better predictive power on many example data sets. If, if you know, if, if a straight line is not the, um, the best model for them. Anyhow. No, that was great. I really enjoyed that. Thanks. Uh, thanks well, for you're, too, you're too kind. But this is... I only give talks I'm passionate about, and I've been doing a lot of teaching lately, and I'm trying to do undo some of the practitioner anti-teaching. And I, you have to sympathize with why did they come up with what they came up with, um, that most of them were trying to, were successfully dealing with a problem, otherwise the method wouldn't have survived. Um, but some of them are just bad practices. The data reweighting um, kills, just kills me. I, I think there's a, there's a, there's a, rule of thumb going around that you should structure talks in such a way that people always have one takeaway item and you oh. were perfect today because i hadn't heard this bad thing about scikit learn mm -hmm. i'd heard the one that they do regularization uh i think it was for logistic without telling you which was a big outcry a couple of years ago so that's kind of bad unless you know you always do predict and they defend by saying well that's very anyway, long story short i hadn't heard the one about the unbalancedness and class labels so that's that's good i took something away. cool again that's not automated that's just practitioners on top of it but yes it's, it's because the predict the probability predictors this odd named function called predict prob a and no one remembers it um cool the soup that you've been very super polite did, and i apologize for butchering your name did you have any questions or anything we help you with um no i'm good thank you for the the, the presentation it was very nice Oh, no, I, I, it's, we're here for you. So I just, uh, um, again, I know hopefully some other people will view it later. Uh, I, I was trying to watch all three of your faces, which helps me. I'm sorry, um, Alton has his hands up and I ignored him. I apologize. Oh, no worries. I, I yeah, uh, students come first, but I do have a question before we the meeting ends. I, I guess I was, so the discussion of accuracy um, when about categorical variables got me thinking about measures of accuracy and regression, right? So when you started your discussion about supervised learning, I was curious how often you find it appropriate to choose a non-OLS or a non-least squares metric of accuracy in industry, right? Like, should you choose a Huber loss or an uh, absolute value loss? Um, should you use a Poisson uh, divergence um, and yeah, how those things fit into your experience. I'm incredibly conservative. So I, I don't use a Poisson divergence because that algorithm seems to never converge. Like you'll, <laughs> you'll, you'll give it a problem and it'll throw. So I would like to use it because I think a lot of my problems have true multiplicative structure. But I've had, an, so I keep trying again and again. So I've had bad luck with that. The I don't use the Huber loss because many of my clients are web clients. 
And what they get is that 99 people out of 100 don't click on the ad, and one person does and pays $13. And they need they need the average person to be worth 13 cents. That they 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 need that the outliers they can't treat or diminish the outliers because they need the unbiasedness that that it's um that everything they're using linear regression but everything's atypical and they need that is it's almost always zero and so i i tend not to use huber loss but i've not experimented with it so i might be missing out on a lot but i've i found that um that unbiasedness is so important for my clients that um that is and I, I apologize if Huber loss is unbiased. I was assuming it wasn't because I know it deals with the boundaries, but I could be entirely wrong because I've not used it. Yeah, I my personal gripe with it is that it has an extra tuning parameter. It makes the math a little trickier. Um, but yeah, it should be more robust to the outliers. So that but you probably, don't want in my episode, you don't want to be exactly. adverse outliers. The outliers are not exceptions. They're what's keeping you alive. Right. Um, that's really that's, interesting. That's really weird. And again, um, so hyperparameters, when I do the longer course, they're technical debt that mm -hmm. somebody that has the correct values of the hyperparameters are going to outperform you. But if the algorithm were so well implemented, it would search for them for you because it's it's um, and, and some algorithms do like XGBoost has its own hyperparameter search built in because like you mm -hmm. you need this hyperparameter. Well, why the heck wouldn't you find it for me? Um, so hyperparameters everyone gets super in love with them and I, I try to just back them off a little that you you have to deal with them but think of them as technical debt that that right. if the if the algorithm implementer was actually your friend they would have wrapped it and calculated it for you and, and like random forest doesn't expose its hyperparameters like it works correctly out of the box defaults because that was the expectations when it came out but XG boost a much newer tree algorithm it says oh no people are used to suffering through hyperparameters I, I don't work out of the box you need to put in some extra pieces and it's, so it's just that interesting change in expectations yeah no, thank cool. you and again I get excited so I often speak beyond my actual knowledge and again I don't have experience with Huber loss because I haven't tried enough yeah I mean I I listed um just as a yet another option, right? I mean, there's also you know quantiles and um, outside so of the medium. Kronecker's, Kronecker's quantile regression is a work of art. And um, I, I happen to be expert in convex optimization and every part I'm an expert on, he got super right. And then the other parts were well-written. So I'm like, he, the, the, his, his book on quantile regression is just a real gift. I've not been able to use it for a client, but Oh, I, I really like quantile regression. I wish I could have a problem. I wish I got more chance to use it. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it does. Yeah. So for instance, yeah, I guess in your applications, if you only care about the average consumer, you can't even train like a 95% quantile regression because um, you might not care about the 95th percentile customer if you really yeah. only care about the outliers. It's really weird, and then I'd have to explain it to people. And I don't think Python's got a good package for it, like R does. But it's it's a work of art. And if you want anything distributional, I think it's wonderful. Right. And I sent him fan mail, and he sent me back a polite letter. So I uh, I'm, I'm a huge fan. He he's very nice. Cool. But yeah. Um, yeah, so right now I I always I always do these talks that you know OLS and uh, logistic regression pay eighty percent of my bills, and again those are both stat methods, and um, I call them right now we're calling them AI, but um, yeah it, it's it's a little weird calling them machine learning, but they're uh, they're so robust or I mean they're not robust in the sense of robust statistics, but they you know you put them in they kind of work. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, I, I want to thank everyone for their time and attention. This actually helped me test out some material. So um, thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much for um, coming to us and talking to us. And I really enjoyed that. And I'll be in touch. Um, this is typically quick with the recording. So I'll probably shoot you an email or a message later um, when I have it up. Should be later today or worst case tomorrow, I hope. So. Well, it was great meeting you all. Thank you again. Uh, it was a real honor. Bye-bye. Thank you.